Hello and good evening. This is Kim Jane and we are here to listen to a debate between a Christian and a Muslim who disagree with each other on a fundamental issue, the crucifixion of Jesus. A debate like this is educational and there should be no inconsistency between loving and respecting a person and vigorously disagreeing with his position. We are here to debate arguments, not people. This debate, therefore, will not be on a personal level. Both speakers will engage the arguments presented, and they will have nothing to do with each other on a personal level. We are all fellow human beings called to love each other, and a debate like this should be nothing to affect the love and respect we have for each other. I will be the moderator for this debate, and my job is to introduce the speakers and give you the rules of the debate. And it is also my duty to see if the speakers stay within their allotted time. The title for the debate is Crucifixion, Fact or Conjecture. Christians believe that the crucifixion of Jesus is perhaps the central doctrine of Christianity. They believe that his death by crucifixion is the key that unlocks the door to salvation. In contrast, Muslims deny the crucifixion of Jesus they believe that Jesus did not die on the cross, but that God raised him up to himself. So which is true? What are the evidences for and against the crucifixion of Jesus? Is the crucifixion of Jesus a fact, or is it just conjecture? Our speakers will be engaging with these questions as the debate unfolds. To introduce our speakers, for the Christian position, we have Jeritan with us. He is a medical student from India. For the Muslim position, we have Sheikh Inamullah Mumtaz. He is founder and president of Quranic Dawah Center International, abbreviated QDCI, in Lahore, Pakistan. And he has authored many books. His latest book is called Paulinity. He has also debated Christian apologetics, such as Sam Shamun. And he will present his case against Christianity in his latest book, Paulinity. That said, we will now move to the debate rules. The structure of the debate will be as follows. Each speaker will have a 20-minute opening statement, followed by two 10-minute rebuttals and two 8-minute rebuttals, one for each speaker. The speaker will then provide a 5-minute closing statement. If either of the debaters goes over their allotted time, I will interrupt and promptly ask them to terminate their time. The time will be sounded by the alarm of a bell tower. Jeritin will be our first speaker who will be giving us his 20-minute opening speech. And the time begins when he begins. Uh, I begin by thanking Mr. Mumtaz for accepting my invitation to debate this important topic. And I also thank him, Jane, for volunteering to moderate this debate. The topic for our debate is the crucifixion of Jesus. Was it a real event that happened in history or is it a conjecture? Now notice that the question is not, is the Bible the word of God or is the Bible inerrant? Therefore, I am not going to defend the inerrancy or the inspiration of the New Testament. The debate is also not about St. Paul. We are not asking whether or not Paul contradicted Jesus' teachings or whether or not he contradicted the Old Testament. Also notice that the question is not why did Jesus die? We are not in this debate asking the meaning or the theological interpretation of Jesus' death. Rather, we are asking the question, did it happen? Was it real? And so even if the authors of the New Testament disagree or contradict each other on theological interpretations of Jesus' death, which I don't think they do, but even if we grant that, that would still be irrelevant to the topic of our debate. Our topic is the crucifixion, fact or conjecture. Our question, therefore, is concerned about a historical event rather than a theological interpretation of that event. So keep these distinctions in mind as the debate unfolds because in a debate such as this, it is very easy to get off track. 
Now, to answer the topic of this debate, I would like to divide my arguments under two headings. First, a defense of my methodology, which I'll be using in this debate. And second, the case proper, where I will be constructing a historical case for the crucifixion of Jesus. So let's look at the first one more carefully. A defense of my methodology. Now, in his book, Paulinity, Mr. Mumtaz calls the Quran as the criterion for assessing the Bible to test its validity. He writes in page 15, quote, Whatever in the Bible confirms with the Holy Quran, we will take it, and whatever it goes against it, we will reject it, end quote. However, notice that the use of the Quran as a criterion for truth is purely a subjective criterion, which can be used only by Muslims who believe the Quran to be God's word. As the late Islamic theologian Ahmad Didat pointed out, quote, had the Christians accepted the Holy Quran as the word of God, the problem of the crucifixion would never have arisen, end quote. But the problem is that Christians don't believe the Quran to be God's word. So we can't use the Quran as the criterion to assess whether Jesus' crucifixion is real or not. Likewise, Muslims don't believe the Bible to be the word of God, and hence they can't use the Bible as God's word to assess the historicity of the death of Jesus. So we are in need of some objective criteria or standard which we can both use to investigate the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, do we have them? Fortunately, we do. Professional historians have developed sophisticated tools to unlock the past. These objective criteria have come to be called in scholarship the criteria for authenticity. Let me just name a few of them which professional historians use to investigate a historical figure such as Jesus. 1. The criterion of early attestation. Let me define that. If a saying or an event of Jesus is reported early, that is, within a few years after Jesus said or did those things, then it is more likely to be historically true than it would have been had it been reported late. In other words, if a report about Jesus is close to what it reports, then it is more likely to be reliable. Two, the criterion of multiple independent attestation. An event mentioned in several independent documents is more likely to be historically true than it would have been had it been mentioned in only one. Three, the criterion of embarrassment. If a tradition about Jesus is embarrassing or awkward to the author who writes it and to his community, then it is highly probable that it is true because the author won't invent or make up such an awkward tradition about Jesus. Four, the criterion of unsympathetic report. If a tradition about Jesus is reported in writings of authors who were unsympathetic towards or disinterested with the early Christian movement, then that tradition is likely to be historically reliable. This criterion is also called the criterion of enemy attestation. If your enemy says something good about you, then it is more likely that he's telling the truth because your enemy would be making that up. Now, there are several other criteria, such as the criterion of dissimilarity, the criterion of contextual credibility, and so forth. But these four criteria, which I've just now defined, are sufficient to build my case. 
please note that these criteria are commonsensical. Whether you are a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, an agnostic, or even an atheist, you can agree to use these criteria as well. In other words, these are objective standards or criteria. These are the tools of modern professional historiography which historians use to unlock sayings and events of people in the past. Now, of course, uh, using these criteria will not yield 100% certainty. However, we can establish historical events to a point beyond any reasonable doubt. Now, that said, let us now come to the second one, the case proper. Here, I will be using the criteria for authenticity, which I've just now mentioned, to build a historical case for Jesus' death by crucifixion. I will provide four lines of reasons for thinking that the crucifixion and death of Jesus is real. Reason number one, Jesus' death by crucifixion passes the criteria of early attestation. One of the most important advancements in contemporary New Testament scholarship is the discovery of pre Pauline materials, or quotations, peppered throughout Paul's epistles. And one such pre-Pauline quote is the creedal formula quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5, I delivered to you as of first importance what I myself received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas, then to the twelve. Notice that Paul is saying that he gave to them, that is, the Christians in Corinth, what he himself was given. Now, to give you a timeline, Jesus died in A.D. 30, and Paul writes this letter in A.D. 55. He first visited Corinth and delivered the gospel to them in A.D. 51. So if Paul delivered the gospel in A.D. 51, then he must have received it before A.D. 51. Now, scholars generally place Paul's conversion into Christianity between 18 months and three years after the death of Jesus. So we will take it to be approximately two years after Jesus' death. So if Jesus dies in AD 30, then Paul is converted in AD 32. And in Galatians, Paul says that he visited Jerusalem in AD 35, in order to meet with Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, and James, Jesus' own brother. And most scholars believe that Paul received this creedal formula from Peter and James during this period in AD 35. But if Paul received it from them in AD 35, then that means that the creed have been formulated before AD 35. In fact, it may shock you to learn that today it is virtually universally accepted in scholarship that this creedal formula found in 1 Corinthians 15, which reports the death of Jesus, is dated to within three years after the crucifixion of Jesus. The Jesus Seminar, which is a group of scholars who protect nearly 87% of the red letter words attributed to Jesus in the Gospels and don't believe in anything supernatural in the Bible, they date this creed to no later than AD 33. The atheist New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann says this, quote, all the elements in the tradition of 1 Corinthians 15 are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus. End quote. 
and scholars are also in agreement that this is an eyewitness testimony. According to the Jewish scholar, Jewish scholar, Pinkus Lapid, quote, this unified piece of tradition, which soon was solidified into a formula of faith, may be considered as a statement of eyewitness, end quote. Another famous Jewish scholar, Case of the Mesh, declares that the creed in 1 Corinthians 15 is, quote, a tradition Paul has inherited from his seniors in the faith concerning the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, end quote. Now, don't miss the implications here. These are non-Christian scholars who are agreeing with three things. One, the creed which reports Jesus' death is early, dating to within three years after the crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, the scholar James D.G. Dunn dates it to within months after the crucifixion. Two, the creed which reports Jesus' death is eyewitness testimony. And three, the creed which reports Jesus' death goes back before Paul's conversion, which means that Paul did not invent the death and resurrection of Jesus. Thus, the death of Jesus by crucifixion passes the criteria of early attestation. Reason number two, Jesus' death by crucifixion passes the criteria of unsympathetic reports. Jesus' death is not only mentioned in Christian sources, but also in non-Christian sources, Roman, Greek, and Jewish sources, such as Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian, and Marabar Serapion. Thus, we have a wide range of non-Christian sources attesting to Jesus' death. Reason number three. Jesus' death passes the criteria of multiple independent attestation. We have already seen that Jesus' death is reported in Christian, Jewish, Roman, and Greek sources. Moreover, his death is also found in many literary forms, the form of annals, historiography, biography, letters, traditions, the form of creeds, oral formulas, and hymns. This is the strongest form of multiple attestation you could possibly ask for. Historians crave for these kind of evidences. Reason number four. Jesus' death by crucifixion passes the criterion of embarrassing report. In numerous accounts of Jewish martyrdom literature, the Jewish martyrs act bravely under extreme torture and execution. For example, in 4 Maccabees, which is a pre-Christian literature, Eleazar is whipped till his flesh is stripped. He then says that more painful than torture is the thought of compromising his character and becoming a poor example for the youth. He is then burned to the bone and about to die, but he praises God telling him that he had endured to suffer till the end. There are other martyrdom accounts, such as those found in 2nd Maccabees, the martyrdom of Polycarp, and so forth. In all these accounts, the martyrs are valiant and strong to the very end. But when we come to the Synoptic Gospels, particularly Mark, reports of Jesus' suffering and death portray Jesus as weaker and far less valiant than other Jewish martyrs. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus anguishes over his impending death and wants to avoid it if at all possible. This would certainly not have inspired those to whom Jesus had told earlier that if anybody wanted to be his disciple, then they should take up their cross and follow them. His, his premature death on the cross is further evidence of his weakness and frail nature. If the gospel writers were inventing myths and legends about Jesus, 
then we would expect them to portray Jesus as a brave and courageous person who, like the Jewish martyrs, would have said, Racks and stones may break my bones, but resurrection awaits me. But you don't find a Jesus like that. So, given the awkward and embarrassing description of Jesus' suffering and death, it is highly probable that the Gospel writers are telling the truth and that they were not inventing lies about him. For these and other reasons, today, virtually 100% of New Testament historians agree that Jesus was crucified and that the process killed him. John Dominic Crossan, a fellow of the Jesus Seminar, says this, quote, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be, end quote. Bart Ehrman, an agnostic scholar, says this, quote, the crucifixion of Jesus by the Romans is one of the most secure facts we have about his life. Whenever anyone writes a book about the historical Jesus, it is really, parenthesis, really, really important to see if what they say about his public ministry can make sense of his death. If not, then you have a problem. So, if my opponent wants to say that the crucifixion of Jesus is not a fact, but merely a conjecture, he should either show that my methodology is wrong, or he should tear down my historical case for Jesus' crucifixion and construct another, showing that the crucifixion of Jesus is a conjecture, showing that the biblical authors disagree on theological issues of the crucifixion of Jesus, or that the Bible contains errors and contradictions, will do nothing to answer the topic of this debate, much less affect my case for the crucifixion of Jesus. Thank you. Okay, that was Jeriton's opening speech. Now, Sheikh Inamula Mumtaz will begin his opening statement for 20 minutes. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وجعلنا ابن مريم وأمه آية وأويناهما إلى ربوة ذات قرار ومعين صدق الله العظيم قال رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي عمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي Respected viewers, listeners and moderator Thank you very much for this opportunity the ayah which I have read is actually from Surah Al-Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 50. Allah says, And we made the son of Mary and his mother as a sign. What is the sign? That he was born miraculously without any male intervention. We gave them both shelter on high ground, affording rest and security and furnished with springs. Chapter 23, verse 50. Meaning, not a bruise was given to Jesus Christ and his mother all along in their entire lives. This is what it means in the Holy Quran, chapter 23, verse number 50. It is amazing that Jeriton rarely used any quotation from the Bible. He only used 1 Corinthians, chapter 15 by Paul. And that's all. All the time he was talking about history, history, history. I will not quote history. I will give few history, the, the apocryph apocryphal books which uh, denies that crucifixion event. Book of Isaiah says, Prophet Isaiah, God is speaking to Isaiah in chapter 43 verse number 10. God says, ye are my witnesses, you people down on the earth, saith the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen, meaning Isaiah, that ye may know and believe me, who? God. And understood that I am He, I am He, God, God alone. Before me, there was no God formed. God said to Isaiah, before me, there was no God formed. Meaning if the Hindus are crying about Hanuman and all these, you know, Shiva, Brahman, Vishnu, God said, I never came down to earth or in any form. Neither shall there be after me. God said, neither there shall be after me. Not anything 
formed before me. There is no savior. And the next verse says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no savior. Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 10 to 11. Now I'm asking to the fellow Christians, brethren, that this verse is very explicit, dogmatic, and emphatic. That no savior will come, and I am God, no formation will come God incarnate. This Isaiah prophet, when God was revealing to Isaiah, these Jews were not having Jesus with him, with them all along. There was no man God with them. So my brother Jeriton will explain that. Then the book of Psalms says, chapter 49, verse 7 to 9, no one can die for the sins of another. No dying for the sins of another. If these things must be understood correctly, there was no need of crucifixion events. Because crucifixion is the thing that God died for our sins on the cavalry cross. This is the heart of the matter. He died and he redeemed the original sin. There is a saying, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. When Prophet Muhammad وسلم, opened his mouth against Makkah, what happened? They ridiculed him. They laughed over, them, over him, Prophet Muhammad. Second, they violently opposed him. That don't spread the message of Islam. Third, it is, being, it is accepted as being self-evident. And it was accepted because the evidence was so strong. And I hope the evidence which I'm going to give to you people, inshallah, it will work. And this quotation was not by me. It was by Arthur Scope and Hover. I hope I pronounced right. Then there is another quotation by Major Yeats Brown in the book, In the Life of the Bengal Lancer. He says, No heathen tribe. Heathen means you and me. Sorry, not you, only me and the people who doesn't believe in, G in the uh, Christian Christianity doctrine. No heathen tribe has conceived so grotesque an idea, meaning filthy dirty idea, involving as it does not the assumption that man was born with a hereditary stain upon him, original sin, remember I just quoted a few minutes before, and that this stain for which he has not personally responsible was to be atoned for, and that the creator of all the things had to sacrifice his only begotten son to neutralize this mysterious curse. My dear brothers and sisters and whosoever listening to the debate, Major Yeast Brown said this is the most nonsensical idea. You are not being concerned and the God will judge you. Couldn't he forgive you? The majesty of God, he can forgive you. That's the real majesty. Not that he's, he's just degrading himself in a mother's womb. Uh, 40 days she was impure and she has to sacrifice pigeons because of the Old Testament of the book of Leviticus. No, he said, no, this is not the right ethics of doctrine and theology. Coming to the subject, where we Muslims stand, I have to clear this point, where we Muslims stand. The commentary of Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 157, commentary, where we Muslims stand, that, let me clear this point, we Muslims don't believe that Jesus was put on the cross for a while and he got free from death. We don't believe that. What we believe that he was not put on the cross for not even a second, picosecond or a nanosecond. Whosoever was put on the cross was actually not Jesus Christ. It was something, his appearance. This is what Jews thought that we killed Christ. Shub, meaning something conjecture. This is the subject. Ibn Abbas says, the disciple of Prophet Muhammad he says, just before Allah raised Isa to the heavens, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ went to his companions who were 12 inside the house. When he arrived, his hair was dripping water and he said, There are those among you who will disbelieve in me 12 times after he had believed in me. He asked them, Who volunteers that his image appear as mine and be killed in my place? He will be with me in paradise. One of the youngest one among the volunteered and said, Isa, I will do it. So Jesus Christ, what happened? Then the young man volunteered again and again. He convinced Jesus again and again that I want to do that. Then he was chosen. You will be that man. And the resemblance of Isa was cast over that man while Isa ascended to heaven from a hole in the house. When the Jews came looking for Isa, they found that young man and crucified him. 
believed in him then they divided into three groups this is the most important as jeriton knows the history of early christianity they did, then they divided into three groups one group al yaqubiya meaning jacobites they said allah remained with us long as he will and then ascended into heaven this is blasphemy from our point of view another group an nasturiya meaning nestorian said the son of allah was with us as long as he willed and allah took him to heaven one group was saying that this he was direct god another group said that he was the son of god as today christianity believes man god another group were the muslims this served they said that jesus was only the servant of god then what happened all the persecution happened till the birth of prophet muhammad peace be upon him this statement has an authentic chain of narration leading to ibn abbas and an nasai narrated it through abu qurayb who reported it from abu mahawiya radhiyallahu anhu so this is the muslim point of view we don't believe that jesus was put on the cross for not even a single second what is the real mission of jesus christ let us hear the what bible says jesus says from his mouth not historians i don't want to go to the history and all this stuff because whatever you say the word of god i will read from that that book i don't want to waste the time real mission of jesus jeriton will explain john chapter 17 verse 1 it says these words spake jesus and lifted up his eyes to the heaven and said father the hour is come glorify thy son i don't want to go into the son relationship because god has gotten the you know sons by the tons in the bible anyhow glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee thee is the singular as thou hast given him the power over all flesh god has given him the power of eternity whatsoever he want to do his power was not his own power god gave to him that he should give eternal life to as many as thou has given him what is life eternal i want to ask the christians they said the life eternal is what to believe in jesus on the cross then you will be saved you will be redeemed atonement but over here it says this is life eternal jesus is addressing to the jews that this is life eternal not crucifixion or resurrection he said that they might know the the only true god you are the only true god god almighty and jesus christ whom thou hast sent where is the crucifixion where is the resurrection if i were the if i were the jew at a time of this uh, this uh, statement of jesus christ was i entitled to heaven or not if i believed him jesus that jesus yes you are the prophet of god and you have thou been sent by by the god almighty and he is the god who is in the heavens so would i be entering into the heavens or not yes of course because there is no resurrection no crucifixion then jesus says i have glorified thee on the earth i have finished i have finished the work which you gave us to me what does it mean i have finished the work if something was pending on his queue then he wouldn't have said this statement i have finished the work and now o oh father glorify thou glory glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which i had with thee before the world was in the knowledge of god and you know what happened now the new translation of the version of the bible they removed the word finish this is what i never like in the, the authors of the bible that are doing the, to the language to the translations deceiving to the people deceiving to the people the word here jesus says i have finished this word finished is taken out all the new translation of the version because this word is used in john chapter 19 verse 30 where jesus supposed to be saying on the cross it is finished with me these authors they think that how can you do two finishes to get your pay so they remove one finish and they put word complete now what is the difference between complete and finished now the complete has a sense of in the terminology that you have something more to do so they remove the word finished and they put the word complete and in john chapter 19 was 30 they put the word finished what games do you people are playing anyhow now let us come to the the marching of jesus christ towards the temple of jerusalem what i am trying to tell you about from the bible is the conjecture this is not right this is what i am saying because allah says in the holy quran in chapter 4 verse 157 158 waqawlihim and they said in both inna qatalna almasiha isa ibn maryam rasulullah that we killed christ jesus the son of mary the messenger of allah wa ma qataluhu wa ma salabuhu allah says but they killed him not nor crucified him walakin shubbiha lahum but it was made to appear to them so wa inna allazina akhtalafu fihi and those who differ therein lafi shaqq minhu are full of doubts 
they have no certain knowledge what really happened because they are following zan which means conjecture guesswork fiction but surely they killed him not read mark chapter 14 verse 50 mark says the most critical juncture at the lifetime of jesus christ was all his disciples forsook him and fled away all first forsook him and fled away fled away so how would they know what really happened this is allah says everything that they are following is something guessworks this might happen or this might happen this gospel says this this gospel says this these are the guesswork and religion doesn't go with guessworks so this is what i'm trying to prove you can sense there is something you know fast and loose with the scriptures they are not sure what they are talking about in the bible Jesus was marching towards the city, uh, Jerusalem. This was his right mission, real mission. People were saying, Hosanna, the son of David. Hosanna, the son of David. Luke chapter 19, I'm reading. And what happened? Jesus was marching. He said to the people, to the disciples, the, when the other people were stopping them, Jesus told to his disciples that in Luke chapter 19, verse 27, those who do not want that I shall reign over them, I shall rule them, bring them hither and slay them in front of my eyes. Jesus says, slay them with the sword or what? Slay them who doesn't want that I should rule, I should rule him or her. So what is this all about? If his purpose was crucifixion, his purpose was self-sacrificing, this is not the way to self-sacrifice. So Jesus is saying that this is my mission, what? To glorify God. Because Jews were going, they were breaking the laws of the gods and the commandments. So this is what Jesus came to rectify and to put them and to exceed their limits from the scribes and the Pharisees. This is the real mission of Jesus. He said that, Father, I glorify thee. Khalas. Now my mission is finished. I need my pay. Then Jesus was marching towards the desert. What happened? He failed. This is what Bible says. He failed. It was a failure. Then what happened? He was escaping here and there. All this crucifixion, they tried to murder against Jesus Christ. So Allah says, وَمَكَرَوْ وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَعْكِرِينَ And the, these Jews or whosoever, they plotted a plan to kill Jesus and Allah too planned. And the best of the planners is Allah. So there is nothing about original sin or redemption. There is nothing about this. Jesus came to deliver the message. As John the Baptist came and he was beheaded. As Jesus came, they also tried to kill him. But God saved him. Let us come to the tittle tattle of spiritual body or a physical body with the flesh and bones. This is the conjecture. Jeriton, this is the conjecture. We read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Before going into it, let me tell to my viewers. When Paul saw Jesus' apparition on the road of Damascus, it was not physical. It was spiritual. According to this understanding, he wrote all his epistles that Jesus died and was resurrected spiritually, not physically. Remember that. We read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 4 that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. I am asking why according to the scriptures. If Paul was sure, he must use from the scriptures or God revealed me, not according to the scriptures. According means he doesn't know what he's talking about. And what scriptures is he talking about? This is my question to the general Christian. What scriptures Paul was talking about? Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, these four gospels were not written at Paul's time. What Old Testament? Which verses he is talking about? Let us hear those verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is in vain, our religion is vain. Nothing. Christianity has nothing to offer to mankind. What? If Christ is not risen from the dead. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 42, what is resurrected body look alike? He says, so will it be the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown a natural body, it is raised as a spiritual body. So far so good? Yeah, that's it. He says spiritual body, not other body. Jesus confirmed the statement of Paul in Luke chapter 20. Jesus says, there, were, uh, there was a case, some of the Sadducees came and they asked the question, the teacher, Moses wrote for us that if the man brothers dies and leaves the wife and on and on, then the heart of the matter, Jesus says that if somebody is dead, now then at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, she be since the seven were married to her? The question was asked, Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given marriage. And they can no longer die for they are like the angels. And then Jesus says they are God's children 
since they are the children of resurrection. So Paul says, spiritual. Jesus says, angels. Meaning spiritual and angels are synonymous terms. If not, then it is a contradiction. So, according to Jesus, once you die, you will be likened to the angels having no flesh and bones. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 40 to 48, resurrected body will be spiritualized. Jesus says further, it will become likened to angels. It means angels and spiritualized are synonymous terms. Then we read in Luke chapter 24, as time is very premium, I don't want to go into the details. Luke chapter 24, verse 36, we read. This is the happening where Jesus was escaped. Meaning disciples don't know what really happened, they didn't know. So Jesus met them and they, he came to the disciples after the alleged crucifixion or resurrection. I said alleged. Now we read. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to peace to you. And they all were terrified and frightened. Jeritan will explain why these disciples got frightened and terrified. Why? Because Luke tells us that suppose they had seen a spirit. Spirit. And Jesus said, a spirit has no flesh and bones. And Paul said, the spirit is an angel. Angel means resurrected body. So further it says, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why thou doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones. You see, I have finished. When he has said this, he showed them his hands and feet further. While they still did not believe for joy, marveled, he said to them further, have you have any food here? So they gave him a piece of wild fish and some honeycomb and he took it and he ate. What for? Jeritan, just tell me simple thing. When your time of repetal... Anyhow, my time has expired. So inshallah in my rebuttal I will keep the rest of the part. Okay, thank you both. And now, Jeriton will begin his 10-minute rebuttal. You may recall that in my opening speech, I gave a list of what the debate is not concerned with. And in that, I said that the debate is not concerned with the uh, inerrancy, inspiration, or the theology of the cross. I said that they are irrelevant to the topic we are discussing. And in his opening speech, Mr. Muktas uh, referred to Isaiah, and he referred to Psalms saying that uh, one person cannot carry the sin of another. These are all theological issues. And I made it clear that we are not discussing a theological interpretation of the crucifixion of Jesus. So keep those distinctions in mind. Secondly, then I divided my speech into two. First, I talked about the methodology which I'll be using to answer the topic of this debate. I said that using the Bible or the Quran as inspired books will only be subjective and hence I argued for some objective standard or criteria and I listed four of them. The criterion of early report, multiple independent report, enemy attestation and an embarrassing report. And I don't think that he has uh, any answer to this thing. The, the point is using the Bible or the Quran is subjective and he has not raised any issues with that. And Next, he said that, uh, yes, he said that don't quote the Bible all the time. Uh, you're going for history. I didn't quote the Bible even once. He said that I quote the only first Corinthians 15. But here I want to point out that uh, in his own book, Mr. Muktas appeals to history. He says in page 93 of his book, quote, Every learned historian knows that Jesus, uh, that the Jews intended to kill Jesus under the Roman law, end quote. So he is appealing to history and to historians, but he doesn't want me to do so. Second point that I would like to mention here is that even if I prove that Jesus did die on the cross uh, using the Bible as God's word and without going to history, then you can easily dismiss it by saying, ah, but I don't believe your Bible to be God's word. So, better luck next time. So what's the point of me proving it? That is why I employed another method which we can both use to uh, see, assess the historical crucifixion of Jesus, but he fails to see the point that I made. Uh, just think about the criteria of authenticity which I mentioned in my opening speech. Wouldn't you agree that if your enemy says something good about you, or if, some, uh, or if you say something bad about yourself, then there's a high chance that it is true. Isn't it commonsensical? Do we not uh, apply the standards in everyday life? Yes, we do. In fact, 
even Mr. Mumtaz has applied the criterion of embarrassment in his own book. Uh, he quoted the Protestant theologian Karl Barth in order to say that the Old Testament does not have a doctrine of the Trinity. And his reason for citing him is to convey the message uh, that Christian scholars will not say something that is embarrassing to Christianity uh, unless if they have really good reasons to say so. So, you see, even unknowingly, you yourself employ the criteria for authenticity uh, in your book. And these are the same uh, standards which I have used to argue for the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, another point that he mentioned was that three groups, he mentioned three groups uh, in early Christianity, saying that the first one was Jacobites, the second one was Nazarenes, and the third one was the Muslim group. Uh, in relation to this, I would like to ask him a question. Uh, in his book, page 103, in Paulinity, he says that the Gospel writers of the New Testament, quote, deliberately hid the fact that, uh, or not this, I'll just uh, quote the other one. Uh, in page 71 in his book, he says that the original church started in Jerusalem in AD 33, and in page 71. So I would like to ask him what he means by this original church in Jerusalem. And what are the beliefs of this original church? And what are your evidences to support your answer? I hope he can answer that because he says there are three groups in early Christianity, first century Christianity. And he says one of them were Muslims. So I'd like to ask for the evidences. Did these Muslims believe in the crucifixion of Jesus or did they not? What are the evidences? Second, lastly, uh, then, I, then I applied my methodology to investigate the life of Jesus. I gave four lines of reasons for thinking that the crucifixion of Jesus is real. And I don't think he went there. The only point that he mentioned was, uh, yes, according to the scriptures and Paul's vision, I'll be coming to that after some time. And uh, the thing that he mentions about the Bible was that he quotes John saying that the real mission of Jesus uh, came into a completion before he went to the cross. And this, I think, is mentioned in John chapter 17, verse 4. Uh, when you read John's Gospel, however, we have to see that Jesus had two works in mind which he had to finish. First, to glorify God on earth, and second, to die on the cross for the world. In John 17, 4, Jesus says that he had finished the work of glorifying God. But read also John chapter 19, verse 30, where Jesus, while hanging on the cross, utters the cry of ultimate victory. It is finished. So the first work he finished before going to the cross and the second work he finished on the cross. The one doesn't negate the other. Next thing he mentioned was that uh, he quoted Mark 14 saying that they all forsook him and fled. Uh, but just read what it says three verses later in Mark 14 chapter 54th verse. Peter followed Jesus at a distance. In fact, they both, Jesus and Peter, were the same courtyard. And Luke 22, 61 even reports that Jesus looked straight at Peter while he was being arrested and tried. And John 19, 26 reports that the, that the disciple whom Jesus loved was standing so close to the cross that Jesus was able to converse with him while on the cross. Uh, and then he said, yes, he quoted a... Uh, Luke 19 and says that Jesus uh, ordered the people to slay his enemies. Well, here I think that he has uh, misread what Jesus said. Uh, this parable, this is actually a parable. In Luke 19, 27, Jesus is saying a parable. And yes, it does carry a sharp and violent meaning. Jesus foreseeing that the Jews would reject him and his kingdom message declared judgment on them, which of course came to its fatal fulfillment in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The parable is a reference to the awful ruin and disaster that would soon follow and overwhelm the city and the temple and the whole nationality. Jesus did not mean that he was going to lead a political battle then and there. Uh, next he said that Jesus' mission failed. I already said that Jesus did not intend to lead a revolutionary political uh, mission. And then uh, he came to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, first he said that Paul saw a vision of Jesus. It was not a flesh and blood. 
uh, yes but this is because paul's uh, jesus appearance to peter was post ascension whereas his appearance to the disciples were pre ascension and whatever you make of paul's appearance paul clearly believed in and preached the bodily resurrection of jesus just read acts chapter 13 verses 36 to 37 uh, i don't have time to quote it but you can read it paul says uh, Je- the david died and his body is still decaying but jesus died and his body is still not decaying god raised him so it's in acts 13 and another thing that he mentioned was the yes why according to the scriptures here uh, here i can give two responses the greek is actually katha which means in accordance with and the first response that i would like to give is that the words accordance in accordance with the scriptures is a theological interpretation of the historical death of jesus and it doesn't affect my historical case even if the theological interpretation is wrong that christ uh, died but not in accordance with the scriptures it still doesn't affect the historical case Uh, around which the theological interpretation is bought second response i would like to give is that jesus did die in accordance with the scriptures and by scripture paul is not referring to isolated proof texts uh, that seem to prophesy the death and resurrection of jesus rather uh, as the pauline scholar nt wright says quote the scripture which paul has known and loved as a young man was a story was like a story in search of an ending and when jesus rose from the dead the ending was now revealed and uh, according to the scripture meant that the long scriptural narrative of the story of israel has now reached its dramatic climax the death and resurrection of jesus but it's not talking about one or two proof texts from the old testament it's much richer than that it's talking about the forward running story of israel beginning with abraham and reaching its unexpected climax in jesus his death and resurrection then he mentioned that paul makes the distinction about physical and the spiritual body all right i don't have time for this i'll go for it in the next speech thank you thank you chairton now a shake in the mula mumta will begin his 10 minute rebuttal jaritan first of all let us decide that is the debate is coming from the bible or is coming from the historians books if well if you want to quote history then we will go to the history we will have another debate for that and you are quoting about polyanity i have to do very fast in this <laughs> this time format you are quoting about polyanity you are discussing my book over here my book has so many meanings shades of meaning and there are so many contexts behind it and after that so you can't pick one thing and say that mr mumtaz believe that believe that so if you want to talk about the polyanity we will have something some other time for that let us talk about your scriptures when i quoted you about the azaya where the god said that before me there was no god form neither shall there after me so who was jesus and then the next word god says beside me there was no savior so what jesus came for if he was the savior of mankind so you have to reason with that you can't say that no my approach is something else you cannot limit me you cannot you can't limit me that this is the way you have to do the debate i am quoting your bible just tell me where did i quote wrong this is a very simple thing then you are talking about the parable what parable what you talking about the parable yes it was a parable but what was the parable all about it was conquering the jerusalem it was conquering the temple of jerusalem and hosanna the same songs were parable or what when he was singing the songs when he is uh, upside the money table side down was that parable no he was really uh, doing these all kind of things but he was fed the games of the words don't play the games of the words that this is something else this is something else i quoted your bible come to talk about your scriptures don't talk about historians people don't know about the history so you have to talk about the scriptures what i'm quoting you then this is about the inter- interpretation you said don't quote me uh, scriptures because it depends on the interpretation who will interpret the bible tell me who is interpret the bible jesus moses who everybody is looking at the bible from his own way whatsoever suits the church the church made that canonical gospels so this is a problem first you have to make the principle what is the right way to judge the bible you are quoting your the scholars i will get my christian friends they will quote their scholars and both scholars will be contradicted with contradicting with each other so don't do this and what about the two finishes you said very easily way out if you read emphasize the word john 17 jesus said i have finished the work you gave us to me if it was the crucifixion then he must say another thing and why the next i have finished it's your contradiction brother one place Jesus is saying I have lost none other place Jesus is saying I have lost one 
the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot. This is your problem contradicting statement. This is what I am saying. It is done, conjecture. It's not right. Something is something happening somewhere else and the few later uh, same verses are contradicting the previous verses. Anyhow, let me come to the previous where I was stopped. You know, there is a miracle book of Jonah. Jerita knows very well and he will explain me. You know, scribes and the Pharisees, they came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, 39, 40 and they asked him, Master, show us the sign. Show us the miracle if you are the Christ. So Jesus says, you evil and adulterous generation, always seek us upon the sign. There is no sign shall given unto it except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly's way, so shall the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, Jeriton will explain me what miracle Jonah did. I don't want to go into the time factor because I myself have very less time. So, no time factor, no three days and three nights. Just tell me what was the miracle of Jonah. He was dead in the belly's whale because Jonah chapter 2 verse 1 says that he prayed from the belly's whale to God. So, do dead people pray? You will explain me when Jesus gave this that this is the thing what happened to Jonah is going to happen to me. Then the inner line of defense, Jesus made inner line of defense. Remember Jesus says get the swords. What swords for? In Luke chapter 20 verse 35, 38. And he said unto them, And I sent you without purse and script and shoes lack ye anything? They said nothing. Then he said, For I say unto you that this that is written must be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned amongst the transgressors for things concerning. And he asked them, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. What is this line of defense? When he came to self-sacrifice, you know, see the soldiers how they say, do self-sacrifice. God saved the queen. Halas. Allahu Akbar, khalas. This is not the sacrifice that you are hiding here, running there, making the line of defenses. What for? So, please explain. When Jesus said that I will be like Jonah, how can you put him like to be a Jonah? And book of Isaiah, when God says that no form was made before and that, I will quote you Bible. And when you are talking about the history, we will do that some other time. And when you, then you quote me about polyanity and all that stuff. Here comes the contradiction, conjecture. Now here these contradictions, they are so swear contradictions in resurrection and all these alleged crucifixion events, then even a school child will understand that. Look at the contradiction. Still dark or not dark? Mark chapter 16 verse 1 to 2. When Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices and they thought to anoint Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, just after sunrise, and John 20 says, Mark says this, Mark is the most oldest gospel, Jeriton knows very well. And John says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Now our moderator is, she is American, she can tell me that if you say it in English, it was still dark, what does it mean? And if you say just after the sunrise, what does it mean? So brother, Jeriton will explain what does really happen. How many disciples did Paul see? He was talking about the, you know, witnesses of the disciples. How many disciples? Paul says that Jesus was seen to the keepers and then to 12 disciples, meaning total 13 disciples. Who were these 13 disciples? Keepers was a Peter because Judas aspirated committed suicide. So there were not total 12 disciples. And if you put Matthias for the substitution of the book of Acts chapter 1, last verse, then still it is 13 disciples because it says then to 12, then to Kephas. Now who are the 13 disciples of Jesus? We never heard this terminology in the entire Bible. Then how many disciples did Mark see? Mark chapter 16 verse 14, he said that and Jesus appeared unto 11 as they sat eating. Appeared unto 11? How? How 11? Judas escorated committed suicide and Thomas was not there. Doubting Thomas. In John chapter 20 we read that. He was doubting him. He was not there. So which 11 disciples he was talking about? Brother Jeriton will explain. Then there is an event in the Bible. This amazing event. Dead corpse is wandering around. Matthew only saw it. This is the amazing thing. Matthew says, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And went unto the holy city and appeared into many. Khalas. What happened after that? Finished. Can you imagine Adolf Hitler incinerated 6,000 Jews and only one journalist had recorded it? Only Matthew saw it, no Luke, no Mark, no Matthew, nothing, not a single, you know, doodle is there about this great event and they missed it out, only Matthew saw it. 
Chariton will explain if it is so potent evidence, why only Matthew saw it, none of the other disciples saw it. Now there is a severe contradiction regarding regarding the verses. Look, the oldest document is Mark. Mark says, Jesus is quoting through Mark. Mark chapter 10 verse 34 says, and they will mock him, mock who? Jesus. Flog him with a whip and kill him, but after three days he will rise again. After three days. Hear my word, I said after. Right? The preposition in English grammar, after. Now the Matthew 17, 23 says, and they shall kill him and on the third day he shall be raised again. Do you know the difference between on the third and after three days? On and after the preposition. Luke chapter 18 verse 33 says, they flog him and kill him on the third day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 14 says, on the third day, on the third day, on the third day. And Mark, which is the oldest record document, says after three days. Now, Jeriton will explain, either it was on the third day he was resurrected or after three days he was resurrected. Hope so, an American will help him in his English language. Oh. Alive. We said alive. You know, Jesus, he was alive. You know, all the word resurrection, not once used in the four Gospels for the Jesus Christ. You know that? Not once. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, not once the word resurrected is used for Jesus, for he was that he was resurrected. You never see the word. The word which is the Bible used is alive. And Mary Magdalene saw Jesus, he was alive. How he got alive? Because he was escaped from the skin of the teeth. Jews thought that he killed him, he was not so. So he was alive, he was wandering here and there. They saw Jesus alive, not resurrected, not spiritual. He was alive, he was alive. Mary Magdalene saw, he is alive. Two angels saw, he was alive. Two disciples from the Amos, they saw him alive. My time has expired, inshallah. For the next session, I will be dealing other parts. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And now we will begin our eight-minute rebuttal. Jeritin will start off with his first eight-minute rebuttal. All right. Uh, I just start off with where I left off earlier. Uh, regarding 1 Corinthians 15, the physical and the spiritual body that Paul is talking about here, uh, the Greek words that Paul is using for natural and spiritual is psychators and pneumaticors. Thus Paul writes, it is sown a psychators body, it is raised a pneumaticors body. So what does Paul mean by this? Uh, in that same letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 Paul says the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit uh, they are fully to him and he is not able to understand them but the spiritual man judges all things so here Paul is contrasting the natural and the spiritual man same words notice the same words the unsaved man who is led by his fleshy nature versus the Christian who is led by the Holy Spirit Notice that these same words are used in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 44, uh, where he talks about the natural body and the spiritual body. It does not mean that the spiritual body is non-physical. Rather, it means that the resurrection body is controlled by God's spirit. In fact, uh, Mr. Mumtaz himself agrees with me on this point. Uh, for in his debate with Sam Shimon uh, regarding the prophethood of Muhammad, this is what Mr. Mumtaz says. I'm quoting him word for word. Quote, then, first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse number 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe in every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are from God. Now, now the true spirit is the true prophet. End quote. Notice what he says. The true spirit is the true prophet. Now it says spirit, but he's saying that the spirit is prophet Muhammad. Now, I, I don't think that he's really imagining the prophet to be some kind of a non-physical person. So it's clear that he himself agrees that the word spiritual also means physical. Second response that I would like to say is that the Greek word for natural, which Paul uses, actually means soul. So if you are to literally translate the word from Greek, it should read, quote, it is sown a soulish body, it is raised a spiritual body. Now, notice that Paul is telling that our present bodies are soulish bodies. Does this mean that Paul is saying that we are non-physical souls without flesh and bones flying around? Does he say that our present bodies are made out of soul alone? Certainly not. In the same way, the word spiritual means that the body is animated by the spirit. 
second thing i would like to say is that he mentioned the marriage and resurrection which jesus says in three places mark 12 matthew 22 and luke 20 uh, it is important to know that saying that we will be like angels does not imply that we will be like them ontologically for example if i say that you are like my brother you would immediately ask in what way you will not assume that i meant that you are like your brother in that both of you have flesh and bones because i have not specified in what way you are like your brother so similarly when jesus said that they will be like angels that phrase alone cannot tell us in what way they will be like angels you have to take the context uh, the sadducees asked jesus a question concerning marriage and resurrection and jesus response can actually be formulated in a standard argumentation form let me just construct jesus argument in a standard form premise 1 angels don't marry premise 2 resurrected people will be like angels conclusion therefore resurrected people will won't marry so the comparison in other words is only in one respect that is marriage the new testament scholar nt right thus says quote saying that the resurrected dead will be like angels in heaven does not mean that they will be like them in all respects including disembodiment they will be like angels only in this respect that they will not marry so that's clearly jesus is referring to a bodily resurrection here and he is not referring to some kind of a spiritual or angelic or angelized form in this particular uh, verse and next he came to yes he said that i'm quoting from uh, the history and not from the bible but what he has failed to see is that bible is a book that gives us history it gives us information about actual events that took place 2000 years ago and the only question that bothers us in this debate is is it telling the truth and to answer that question i have applied uh, appealed to objective standards which are the tools of professional historiography rather than an appeal to subjective standards and if the evidence is compelling then you too can accept it because the tools we are using are shared by both of us uh, next he said uh, yes he quoted isaiah saying that it's about god i said it's not about theology and the third one he said about the parables yes it is a parable it's a reference to the destruction of jerusalem in ad 70 it wasn't talking about an immediate context uh, then he said jesus had a political uh, kingdom in his mind no read uh, luke read mark chapter 10 verses 35 to 45 where james and john come to jesus and say, tell him to tell him to place jesus in his left and in his right but jesus says listen the kings and rulers of this world lord it over their subjects and exercise tyrannous authority over them but it must not be so among you because anyone who wants to be the great must be your servant and anyone who wants to be the king must be the slave of all because the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many so clearly jesus is talking about a non political system here and then he mentioned about uh, Jesus finished work i already said that jesus is talking about two different works he is talking about two different john 19 he says clearly on the cross it is finished the same word finished is talking about two different works then he mentions about the sign of jonah he says what is the sign what is the sign he asks well let me say that the sign or the miracle implies something extraordinary so what was extraordinary about jonah and the whale if he was alive he asks uh, the, the thing is, uh, if you are swallowed by a whale, you are not coming out without a miracle. And if you are swallowed by death, you are not coming out without a miracle. That's the analogy here. Uh, and the explanation of mine is confirmed by reading uh, John chapter 2, verse 18 to 19, where the leaders come, to, come and ask Jesus for a sign. Same Greek, same word. They ask Jesus for a sign. And Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up and the temple he refers to his own body so clearly the sign is about his death and resurrection and the sign is the miraculous coming out of death it is not escaping death and next he said in what way are jonah and jesus uh, similar uh, well first uh, one uh, one thing that i have to say here is he emphasizes the time period i'll be coming that uh, coming to it later but the comparison that jesus is giving with jonah is the time period and it is not about the condition of jonah yes uh, here i would say jonah was alive he said no that is wrong jonah was dead in the belly of the whale uh, when jesus mentioned the heart of the earth he was not talking about the tomb he was talking about sheol 
the place of dead in Jewish thought. Read Deuteronomy 32, 22, Job 11, 8, Proverbs 15, 24, Isaiah 14, 15, Ezekiel 31, 17. All these verses talk about Sheol as being a place below or down, which is the heart of the earth. And it's interesting that in Jonah chapter 2, verse 2, uh, when Jonah is in the belly of the whale, this is what he prays. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the womb of Sheol, I called for help and you listened to my cry. And in verse 6 and 7, Jonah is saying, The waters round me rose to my neck and the deep was enclosing me. So I'll say it the last speech. Okay, thank you, Jaredson. Uh, Sheikh Momtaz will now begin his eight-minute rebuttal. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Let me correct uh, Jaredson regarding Jonah. You know, it is very easy way out. You know, the games, the, the words, meaning nothing. That quoting uh, Greek, quoting Hebrew. So the people who translated your Bible are the shoemakers. No, what you're talking about Greek and Hebrew, shallow, this and all that. Don't go into Greek and Hebrew now. Talk what is the translation you have. When Jesus says, like unto Jonah, a sign, a miracle. In a French Bible, it is miracle. Miracle, sign is miracle. Now what's the miracle that Jonah, uh, Jonah was having in the whales? That he was in the whale and he came out, halas? No, when he came out alive, that is the miracle. He didn't die, that is the miracle. You know, it is very easy way out. You know, you can flim flam the people, hoodwink the people. No, no, no. Don't pull over the wool over the people's eye. Explain. And what is theology and all this business you are talking with theology and this? I quoted you Isaiah from your Bible, man. We are discussing theology. This is all theology. What is theology? Do you know the definition of theology? Please come and explain the definition of theology when your time will come. This is all theology we are discussing. And theology, doctrine, and these all things that we are discussing over here. Miracle of Jonah, you are failed to tell. What was the miracle? Miracle that he was alive. Now the difference between the places, yes, of course, Jonah was in the whale. Jesus will be the heart of the earth. You are telling about shallow and this all stuff, Hebrew word you are using or a Greek word. I think there is a Hebrew word, not Greek. And then you are using this word and putting over here. So why the translators are not doing that? Nobody will listen to you, Jariton. You have to make the translation for that, to, put, to prove your case. Then you said about the finish. Why? Read the, read the words. Look at the words. Jesus said, I have finished the work you gave us to me. What was the work God gave to him? That you are the true God of Allah and you, the thou, the messenger you have sent. Finish. Not that I have to die for the people. Where did Jesus say I have to die? Now, if you are so particular with that, uh, your explanation, then why the word finish removed? You tell me. Why the translator, new translator, they don't carry the word finished? Why? Now they remove the finish, they put the complete, if the words are same meanings. You better explain now. Then, contradictions in Judah's death. You know, there is a contradiction in Judah. And one more thing, he didn't explain. Remember, I said on the third day or after three days. You know, that's the problem. On the third day or after three days. You have to explain which writer is saying right. Mark is saying after three days and the rest of the writer saying on the third day so you explain this before you leave contradictions in judas death matthew says that how did judas die he says then judas which had betrayed him he saw that he was condemned repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver and on and on now what he said and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself hanged himself the greek word they use is a choking or squeezing bit with you know grief and emotions now X, X, the book of X says, now this man purchased a field. What is purchasing of a field? This is, means that he was a happy man, you know, he purchased the field, he was so rich. Another says, he threw the money on the table or wherever on the ground, he threw it. So he says, he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple. And the rest, other writer says, no, 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 he kept them and he bought the great field. And what happened? He burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. Please, Jerry Turn explain this which is the right event you know it is very easy to make flowery statements with the playing the games of the words let me rephrase brother Jariton the what things he should come and tell us explain the Isaiah verse without making excuse of theology okay I don't need theology second the miracle of Jonah did that happen or not did Jesus die or not 
did Jonah die? Because Jesus said, what happened to Jonah is going to happen to me. I don't think so. There is any difficulty in it. Now, about the kingdom of heaven. You know, this is amazing. There are so many things. What, what can I quote you in the minimum time? Look, uh, if you read Luke chapter 1, verse number 33, angel came to Mary and said, Mary, fear not. You will have a child, glad tiding, and his name shall be Jesus. His, his name shall be Jesus. And he will take his father's throne, David's throne, and he will rule the house of Jacob forever. Jariton, do you understand the word forever? Forever in English means since you born till your death or whatsoever after that. It means forever. There is no time of starting in it. In English word when we say forever, forever. So angel said that he will rule the house of Jacob forever. And what happens after that? He will take his father's throne, David. <laughs> you know what really happened? Pontius Pilate was sitting on the David's throne and interrogating Jesus. Instead of Jesus will interrogate him. Angel said that he will get his father's throne, David. Jesus said, my own received me not. Angel said to Mary that he will get this. He will rule the house of Jacob forever. Who is ruling in Israel right now? Please, the enemy of Jesus, Jews, who killed him on the cross. They are ruling Israel right now. They are ruling. They have the power of throne on all thrones. They are sitting on it. So prophecy says forever. Forever means forever. Neither Jacob, the house of Jacob accepted Jesus, nor he got anything, the throne of David. And he's contradicting this statement when Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, Thou art the Christ, and on and on stuff, thou art the king. Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world, but the hereafter. But angel said that he will be the king of the world. He will take the David's throne. He will rule the house of Jacob forever. Please, Jariton, explain me without telling me that don't quote me theology. Because we are discussing theology, we are not playing, you know, chess over here. We are not playing chess. We are talking about the religion, about theological problem. So Quran says that it is all conjecture, guesswork and fiction. I gave you the references about the fiction. They don't know what really happened. He's talking about the flesh. When Jesus says, handle me and see, a spirit has no flesh and bones you see me have. He's telling you clearly. You are telling me about Sam Shimon debate. Don't quote me about what happened about Sam Shimon debate, what I have said or not. You are telling about that. I said that about the spirit. Yes. The letter which John is talking about, it is talking about general stuff. He's saying that a spirit, meaning a person will come. But over here, Jesus emphasizes a spirit has no flesh and bones you see me have. So don't mix these two events to prove your case. You know, if there is no explanation given, that is what, what I'm telling you, Jeriton. Heed the explanation. Jesus says, first of all, why they got terrified. You know, read the, you know, you are not reading the whole context. Read the context why the, the people are terrified. Because Luke tells us that he, they were affrighted because they thought that he was a spirit. Why? Because Mark chapter 14 verse 50, all disciples forced to come fled me. Was Peter watching him from behind or from one kilometer away? That's not my business. Your Bible says all forsook him and fled away. It means they don't know what really happened. And that is why they got terrified. Thomas was not there in the upper room too. So when they got terrified, because it's the basic instinct that they thought that he was dead. The guy was dead. Anyhow, thank you very much. I have been noticed my time has expired. Okay, thank you for that. And Jeriton will now begin his closing statement. He has five minutes. All right. In my closing speech, I would like to draw the threads of this debate and see if we can get to a conclusion. I began by listing a series of questions which we are not concerned with this debate. Questions regarding the inspiration of scripture, apostleship of Paul, or the theology of the cross. I made it very clear the topic of this debate is the crucifixion of Jesus. Is it a fact that happened in history or is it a conjecture? So once we are asking about a fact that happened in history, we have to look at the evidence objectively. So the topic of the debate is clearly about a historical event. Did the crucifixion really happen? That's the thing. That is what history is. Theology means interpretation. Did he die for our sins or did he not die for our sins? Those are the theological aspects which we are not interested in this debate. Then I did two things. First, I defended the methodology which I'll be using in this debate. I argued that the Bible or the Quran, using, using them as divine books, would be subjective. And he hasn't 
responded to that. I said, only one side can use it. If I quote the Bible and say that Jesus died, you can say, I don't believe the Bible to be God's word. So it's subjective. And then I went for an objective criterion or plumb line in order to investigate the death of Jesus. And I argued for tools which we normally use and which historians use to investigate the matter. I listed some of the criterion of authenticity, which both Muslims and Christians can use to investigate the life of Jesus. But he hasn't responded to my historical case either. So my historical case for the death of Jesus stands alone. I gave four reasons for thinking that the death of Jesus is real. And he hasn't responded to any of them. Now let's come to the sign of Jonah. He said that, Jonah's, that the sign of Jonah was a miracle. It was a sign. And I quoted John chapter 2 verse 18 to 19. Jesus says the same thing. The sign. It was the sign. When the people tell Jesus to give him a sign, miracle, Jesus says, destroy this temple, my body, and in three days I will raise it up. So clearly, by, by sign, Jesus meant that it is his death and resurrection. And he says, uh, about the, he was complaining about the translation error. Well, why are you looking at translations? We are having the Greek Bible. We are having the Hebrew words. So, just look at the... I, I, I stopped at uh, reading at from verse 6 of Jonah chapter 2. Let me just read verses 6 to 7 of Jonah 2. But Jonah says, in the belly of the whale, Notice that Jonah is in Sheol. The Hebrew word is Sheol, the place of the dead. And this is what Jonah says from Sheol. The waters around me rose to my neck, and the deep was closing around me, seaweed twining over my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank into the underworld, and its bars closed around me forever. But you raised me from the pit, Yahweh my God. So you can see, Jonah is in the underworld. And this is why many theologians say that Jonah actually died and his spirit went to Sheol, the underworld, the place of the dead. And from Sheol, Jonah cried to God and God raised him back from the dead, reuniting his soul with his body and then commanding the whale to throw him out. So clearly the sign of Jonah is the sign of Jesus. Next, uh, he talked about the third day motif. If I could... Okay, next he came to the... Yeah, this is very important. Jesus came to the upper room and he said, Handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones. Here it is very important to know what resurrection is. Because he is assuming that resurrection means that you are just a ghost without a physical body. But in Jewish theology, there was no concept of a bodiless resurrection. Resurrection always meant bodies. So, yeah, this is... Uh, yeah, let me just quote a Jewish scholar to support my view. This is a non-Christian Jewish scholar, Gaze of Pamesh, and this is what he says. That He says that the strict meaning of resurrection is, quote, the revival of a corpse. And he continues, it entails the corporeal revival of the dead, the reunification of the spiritual soul and the material body of a deceased person. So resurrection body is obtaining your flesh and bones back into a glorious and immortal state. It is a transformed physicality. It is not non-physical. Give me one source from the first century or before which says that resurrection is non-physical. You will not find one source. And I said that Paul gives physical resurrection. Jesus talks about physical resurrection and he hasn't res responded to that. Uh, next he said they all forsook him and fled. Yes, but read John. John was witnessing the crucifixion. Take the, everything in context. Uh, then he says that Judas, he was talking about Judas' death. I said it is irrelevant. So, I think he hasn't really responded to my historical case. Uh, I would like faith is reason grown courageous. And I would like to end this with a quote from New Testament scholar N.T. Wright. History, therefore, prevents faith from becoming a fantasy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeritin. And Sheikh Mumtaz will now begin his five-minute closing statement. Jeritin says about the John. What about John? John was the disciple of Jesus. You said that John copied it. From who? John copied it from who? From where? Here witnesses. Because Mark 14, 50 said that none of the disciples were there. What really happened? You are telling me John caught it. John saw it. John recorded it. John was not a disciple. Luke was not a disciple. Paul was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. So how would they know that? How their works are authentic? Jeriton, did, did John resurrect? You said that Jesus resembling with Jonah and that, that Sheol, Sheol is a grave in Hebrew. Now you are talking about the words when Bible says clearly that I will be like Jonah. Jesus said will be like. Do you understand like? Like what is like? 
likewise it's amazing you know reading simple english he is talking about hebrew greek <laughs> but when the layman is hearing this debate he is not going to greek brother to check your words when a layman because religion is not only for you know highly intellectual people religion is for everybody layman to the child to the highly intellectual people it's very simple way out what you are making out theology don't go with then what about the acts what about the death of the judas iscariot you haven't quoted you still did not answer me book of isaiah when god said that because you said theology 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 you are talking about history is it compulsory for me to talk about history of christianity is this the debate is about crucifixion fact history and all this stuff debate is crucifixion fact or conjecture whatever sources i use you just take it whatever you i will take it let people judge now coming to the history call because he need history the lost gospel evidence which proved that jesus was not put on the cross now you said that this is apocryphal let us hear gospel of thomas oldest gospel among all the gospels first century gospel of thomas was in full secret codes gnostics you know gnostics but not mentioned once about the crucifixion or resurrection or salvation you will find the gospel original fragments in cairo egypt nag hamadi in coptic museum gospel of philip there is no resurrection mention no crucifixion mention this is the amazing thing church of saint maria magdalena room there is no crucifixion mention gospel of mary magdalene 1500 years older manuscripts no resurrection no crucifixion it is available in secular library gospel of peter saint peter church rome you know read these gospels who who wrote these gospels it's in the history now you are telling me now you will say that no no these are apocryphal who said that apocryphal churches now you don't want to listen the church you listen the historian you listen listen the scholars so brother please stick you know on the subject we are discussing crucifixion from your bible not from the authors not from the greeks and the originals if you want to talk about the greeks and the originals then bring your manuscripts over here when you talk about the quran we have arabic manuscript original we will put aside and we will talk you are making statements the word is there this and when jesus is talking about this just tell me why would jesus uh, telling to the disciples assuring them that a spirit had no flesh and bones do they don't know this about stuff they were jews they know that if you what you are making it out jeriton that this is hebrew is something else so the jews were they grecians were they philippines no they were jews they must understood everything all these theological stuff you and you are yourself are explaining theology stopping me restraining me that don't quote theology you are self using theology all along and jesus why jesus is telling them that a spirit has but the kids they don't know a spirit had no flesh and bones why because they thought he was a spirit why they thought he was a spirit because they thought that he died simple basic you are just you know um, beating around the bushes and flim flaming and hood winking to the people please brother don't pull over the wool over people i simple thing when jesus why jesus is just telling to the disciples a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have what was the reason for telling these things because they thought something had happened in the past and they were not eyewitnesses and here witnesses and the contradiction i give you severe on after you haven't come to that why it was related to the crucifixion somebody says on the third day and one says after three days you haven't explained and you will never be able to explain till doomsday because this is the you know grave error contradiction in the bible one writer says mark says and rest of others all different and mark is the oldest gospel so should i follow mark that jesus was raised on the third day or should i follow other one that he was raised after three days anyhow i think so my time is already running out so the verdict is the last verdict which i'm going to quote before i just cut off if the jews are in the dike if the jews are in the dike for the trial for the murder of jesus christ yes they are guilty they are guilty not not for murder but attempted murder wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Okay, well, thank you for that. Thanks both of you for your courage and uh, your ability and, and your time for coming to share that with us. We hope those listening have enjoyed listening to this debate, and we will let you, the listeners, be the judge for yourself. Thank you, and have a great day.